Hello and welcome to the Elizabeth Nay Museum's Spotlight Regional Summit, a part of the 2021 National Youth Summit on Gender Equity, an online outreach program organized by the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History in partnership with Smithsonian Affiliations. I am Oliver Franklin, Museum Site Coordinator at the Elizabeth Nay Museum a property of the City of Austin's Parks and Recreation Department. Danae is a proud member of the Smithsonian Affiliations Program, mm -hmm. and we're very excited to be presenting this program to you today. Anchored by a series of diverse historical narratives addressing the fight for gender equity, the 2021 National Youth Summit examines how the construction of gender and gendered expectations have impacted young people across time and space, and how this has created deep-seated biases and inequities. Guided by history, the summit provides a platform for teens nationwide to grapple with the enduring question, what will the future of gender equity look like? As you'll see in the first video we're presenting, Elizabeth Ney is a remarkable case of a trailblazing artist who did not accept the boundaries that she was presented with by cultural norms from her childhood in small town Germany in the 1830s all the way through her death in Austin, Texas in 1907. As you'll see, her legacy endures and resonates in Austin and elsewhere today. After the tour presented by Annie Franklin, a first year student in the Plan II Liberal Arts Program at the University of Texas at Austin and a staffer at the May, we will launch into a discussion about the tour and Elizabeth May's life, moderated by Dr. Janet M. Davis, a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I hope you enjoy the tour. The discussion will follow. Welcome to the Elizabeth Nay Museum. My name is Annie Franklin. I am a first year student at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I'm also a museum educator here at the Nay and I have been for quite a while. Um, and today I'm gonna show y'all around the Elizabeth Nay Museum for this wonderful Smithsonian project that we're really grateful to be participating in. Um, so let's get straight into it. Uh, this is Elizabeth Ney. She was born in Munster, Germany in 1833 to a fairly, you know, traditional family. Uh, they were conservative, but not super conservative. They were Catholic, but not super Catholic. Um, very regular. Those are her parents there on the wall. One notable thing is that her father was a stone cutter and specifically a gravestone cover, cutter. So from a young age, Elizabeth is going to be exposed to sculpting um, and will really find a great interest in, the, in, in, this, in this work. Um, however, the expectation is not that she's gonna follow in her father's footsteps by any means. Um, of course, what is expected is that she'll you know, have some kids, uh, become a housefrau, as they were called, settle down. Um, she had very different plans. Uh, from a very young age, she is going to show herself to be kind of a tomboy. She would always wear her hair short. Um, she much rather preferred hanging out in her father's studio to playing with dolls or anything of that sort. So from a young age, she sort of proved that she was not conventional by any means. And this will culminate when um, around her 18th birthday, she's going to announce to her parents that she wants to go to the Berlin Art School to study under the famous Christian Rau and become a notable, famous, um, you know, sculptor. And of course, they completely dismissed this. This is so not what was expected of her. And just the suggestion of it was kind of comical even um, because it just was not an accepted path for women. Uh, sculpting was very much a man's work. Um, and so for her to demand this was absurd. Uh, she did not agree. So her response to this is gonna be go to go on a hunger strike. And it gets to the point where they're kind of worried about her well-being. It's been many days, she's looking very frail. So they're gonna call in a local bishop to kind of talk some sense into her, get her to stop. Uh, they go into a room together and then about an hour later she comes out or he comes out they both come out and he's going to actually begin to advocate for her um, because she's so persuasive and she's so intent on going to art school and in fact he will become one of her first um, commissioned pieces uh, 
commissioning this piece here of Saint Sebastian, who uh, was a you know Catholic saint. Uh, so this will be one of her first commissions by the man who was you know initially called in to dissuade her from pursuing sculpting. Um, so instead of the Berlin Art School, which is, you know, Berlin is very progressive, it's very Protestant, it's kind of a scary place to be sending your, you know, 18-year-old daughter unattended. So they instead agree that she can go to the Munich School, uh, which is, you know, Catholic, it's traditional, it's a little bit more their speed. They also have a family friend there that can kind of keep an eye on her. Uh, so she goes to Munich and she's going to apply to the school there, um, but is unfortunately going to be summarily rejected, uh, primarily because she's a woman. That's really the ultimate issue here. Um, there, she, there were no women who had been admitted to the school in the past, um, and especially sculpting was considered a very manly uh, pursuit because it was more bodily than something like, like painting or watercolor. Um, and even if a woman was to pursue watercolor or painting or some of these more feminine hobbies, it was a hobby, not a profession. So for Elizabeth to come in and saying that she wants to be a sculptor definitely ruffled some feathers. Um, she's going to apply a second time after kind of working with a local artist to improve her skills and will be finally admitted. She's the first female student admitted to the sculpting program. Um, however, there is a number of restrictions that she's placed under. Um, so for example, she's not allowed to take anatomy classes with the men because that would be too scandalous. Instead, she's given a dead cow to work on as if those are at all equivalent. Um, she's also told not to make a distraction of herself. And that's kind of a veiled threat, honestly, because there's no real definition of what a distraction is. So the message there is kind of, you know, be quiet, do your work and don't distract the men. Um, which is, you know, it's, 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 she's on thin ice basically. Uh, despite this, she's going to really excel and show herself to be a very promising young student, um, will be admitted fully eventually after, you know, they really recognize her as a real talent and will uh, graduate at the top of her class. Um, finally, she will end up in Berlin at the school that she initially uh, hoped to go to upon the strong recommendations that she got in Munich. Again, she will be the first woman. And while there, she will study under this man, Christian Rauch, who's very influential to her. Um, he's very well known. He's kind of the preeminent neoclassical artist in Germany. Um, and his style is very interesting. And Elizabeth very much, you know, draws upon his style. It's a very interesting combination of classical style and then realism. Um, so you get these figures that have, you know, sort of the white marble, um, similar forms to what you'd be seeing in Greek and Rome. However, there is this sort of humanistic focus on the individual. Um, and so Elizabeth will really work to, you know, implement this into her work. And you can see that very much in her style. Um, while she's there, she's also going to meet this man. This is Edmund Montgomery. Uh, he is a Scotsman, and in fact, uh, probably the illegitimate son of a Scottish nobleman. So there's a little intrigue there. Um, he's a doctor, he's a philosopher, and just generally kind of a very interesting man. Um, and they really see eye to eye in a lot of things. They have very similar ideals. They have very similar sort of ideas what their future may hold. And there's a lot of mutual respect between them. So uh, Elizabeth really was opposed to the institution of marriage. She, you know, believed it to be very constraining upon women, almost oppressive, which she's not wrong to point out because at the time it kind of was. Um, her quote is actually, I am the property of no man for why she would never take the name of a man. And so she doesn't. Uh, she will always be Miss Nay, and he actually will refer to her as my dear friend Miss Nay, uh, which is really interesting. It's quite revolutionary, and it is a testament to him, um, not that he like allowed it by any means, but that he, you know, respected her enough to, uh, to you know, abide by this and, and, and understand that her independence was so important to her. Um, so they will actually get married. Um, there is a certificate, um, you know, that we have found proving that they're married. They do have children together, but throughout their lives, they're going to kind of obfuscate this. They're not really going to tell people that they're married. They're always going to sort of keep this pretense of like being friends, um, living together, which confuses so many people and will create some kind of difficulty throughout their life because that is so abnormal. Um, and they really could have just so easily said like, hey, we are in fact married, but they chose not to because um, they both were so dedicated to this idea. 
Um, another thing about Edmund is that he has tuberculosis, which uh, does better in warmer climates. Um, so that will impact their mo mo moves in the future. So yes, they are going to get married. So now that Elizabeth has graduated from art school, her goal is to um, start to kind of make a name for herself in the German scene. And the way that one would do that is by doing pieces of progressively more and more important people. And the first person that she sets upon is uh, kind of interestingly Arthur Schopenhauer, who's quite well known. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very, um, that's a quite a large person to sort of set out as your first big piece, but I think her philosophy is that, you know, this will create quite a bit of buzz around her for um, this woman to get Arthur Schopenhauer to sit for her um, as he was, you know, kind of a curmudgeonly old guy. He was a philosopher um, and was known for being quite misogynistic. And in fact, he will sort of dismiss her as little girl saying like, no, I don't have time to sit for you. Um, Finally, she will sort of grate him down to sit for her. Um, and through the course of this piece, he will become so impressed by her that he will sort of rethink his stance on women, which is sort of a bold claim, I know, but truly he was very impacted by her. Is going to send out letters saying, oh, I've met the most incomparable woman. Uh, Miss Nay is just so remarkable. And his conclusion is basically, well, if women were to apply themselves as men do, then perhaps they can sort of reach the same heights, which is not great, but it is a real testament to Elizabeth's uh, impact on him. Um, actually, we have this picture of her as she was sculpting this piece, and you can see she was a young woman. And um, interestingly enough too, like the way she presents herself is very unique. So for example, you see her short hair, which is very distinctive. Um, also this sort of smock dress that she wears was very unconventional. Um, so you can kind of understand why she was, uh, why Schopenhauer sort of hesitated, d just underestimated her. Um, but she truly had this force behind her that will sort of continue throughout her life. The next kind of major piece she does here is uh, Garibaldi. Garibaldi is the man who unifies Italy. He is a very important populist leader, um, kind of the Che Guevara of his age, and that he's very known and respected and sort of represents these ideals that are sort of becoming uh, popular in this uh, time period. So Elizabeth is a really big fan of his, is going to very much look up to him, and the chance to do his bust is really very significant for her. Um, however, when she does finally meet him, she will be a little disappointed in him. Um, the man she meets doesn't really pan out to the you know, figure that she has come to know and respect. Uh, so for example, he's very narcissistic and he's also quite philandering, so kind of makes a pass at her and she's very uncomfortable with that. So um, her disappointment is almost sort of visible in this piece here. Uh, generally, Elizabeth's pieces are very, very realistic. They really show the individual kind of, you know, in all their flaws. Uh, also, they show like irises, things of that nature that give these pieces life. Garibaldi doesn't really have that. He is this sort of flat uh, face, not even having irises. Um, so in many ways, I believe she was sort of sculpting the figure rather than the man, which is sort of an interesting thing to note. Uh, here we also have Jakob Grimm, Otto von Bismarck, who will end up being very significant later in her life. Um, as you'll notice, though, we only have two women in this whole bank of individuals here. And these two women, uh, of them, this first woman with the head covering, she's actually unknown. We don't necessarily know who she is. I think the best guess is that she was one of Queen Victoria's daughters, but it is not confirmed. And then this other woman, um, she was actually quite a bit more impactful on Elizabeth and had some degree of power. She was um, known for her philanthropy. Uh, but still, this really kind of demonstrates how male dominated um, the sort of highest level of German society was and that the money really lay with the men. And so Elizabeth kind of had to uh, make herself impressive, make herself known in these circles, um, which meant that she didn't really have as many like female, uh, you know, patrons or anybody of that sort because they just didn't have the money for that and they didn't have the power to warrant pieces. So it's just something interesting. Um, 
in doing pieces such as these, she's going to become acquainted with this man, Ludwig II of Bavaria, who will be very important in her life. He is the king of the southern kingdom of Bavaria. Um, very eccentric guy. He is going to be known either as the Mad King Ludwig or the Dream King Ludwig, depending on who you talk to. Um, and he's gonna spend a lot of money on art, on music, on castles such as Neuschwanstein, which is uh, a very famous castle in Germany that he designed. Um, but not so much on state building, on politics. And so he won't be super popular among the politicians of Bavaria, but to somebody like Elizabeth, these artists, he was a very, you know, good person to know. And so after quite a bit of finagling, um, Elizabeth is finally going to land a audience with Ludwig to discuss a possible portrait. Um, this will luckily uh, turn into an opportunity for her as she's able to do his portrait and then later this full body piece. Um, and through the course of their, you know, sort of working together, um, they're going to become really good friends. I mean, they really see in one another these idealistic um, values uh, that you know, Elizabeth really trans, uh, uh, championed in her art, and then Ludwig in his, you know, states. Uh, some people have posited that their relationship was romantic, um, but there isn't all that much evidence for that, especially considering Ludwig uh, was known to have had quite a number of male lovers, very few female connections, so, you know, it's, it is kind of unknown, uh, the exact nature of the relationship. Um, there are quite a few sweet stories about, like, she, he asked um, if he could adorn her studio with jewels, and she said, no, 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 please do flowers instead. Um, and so here you see her studio that he paid for. It's a beautiful room, very ornate, kind of contrasting the room that we're in right now, uh, which is her studio later in life. Uh, it's also quite cool. You can see a bunch of the pieces that are in this photo are also in this room right now. So we have Prometheus, we have Sursum, um, and this is a really prolific period for her. Um, and something else that this allows her to do is to begin doing pieces that are more symbolic versus purely, um, you know, portraits or purely, you know, representative of individuals. Um, and so I'll talk about those in a moment. But we've got Sursum, Prometheus, and a couple others that are interesting in that way. Um, so. This is, however, a very tumultuous time to be in Germany. We are at the cusp of the Franco-Prussian War, in which basically um, the Prussians, led by Otto von Bismarck, who I you know, showed earlier, um, are going to tell these lower German kingdoms, hey, we're coming through whether you like it or not. Either you're going to let us come through and join this confederation of states, or you are going to be steamrolled and also join the confederation of states. So there isn't really a choice uh, for these individuals such as Ludwig. And Ludwig is very angry about this whole situation, about losing some sense of sovereignty. Um, he's not happy. This also is going to put Elizabeth in kind of an uncomfortable position as she is, you know, acquainted with, you know, she's very good friends with Ludwig living in his court, but she's also doing busts of people such as Bismarck and Garibaldi, who's, you know, revolutionary in his own way. And so there are some questions that arise about her allegiances, and she's actually going to be called in by um, Ludwig's government to be questioned on charges of espionage. And then about a week later, she and her husband flee. They just leave everything behind. Um, she's pregnant at the time, so it's kind of a dangerous, you know, departure, but clearly they were, you know, they felt that they needed to get out quickly, which does, you know, quite, you know, raise some questions about like what was so scary for them. Um, but it just was a very bad situation to be in. And he actually will be um, fairly soon after assassinated. So, you know, kind of illustrates the, 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 the situation she was in. Um, and I'll talk about in a moment where she goes after Germany. Really quickly though, I wanna to touch on these two pieces, Sursum and Prometheus. This here is Sursum. Sursum is taken from the Latin mass, Sursum Corda, meaning lift up your voice. So she cuts it to instead just be Sursum, meaning arise or uplift. Um, it is going to show the brothers Remus and Romulus who founded Rome walking up this hill with the torch of art to sort of light the way and the key of knowledge to unlock any doors they come across. So it's really this sort of thesis on humanity in this new age, um, very representative of a lot of the ideals that she sort of believed in and lived, uh, but now in this sort of art 
artistic form, this creative form. Um, and these were made during their honeymoon in Madeira. So these are two little Madeiran boys. We don't know who they are, but it's a really wonderful piece. This one here is also mythological in origin. Uh, this one is Prometheus bound. Prometheus is the Titan who created man from clay. So there's a neat little sculpting connection there. Uh, later, he's going to steal fire from Mount Olympus to give to man, much to Zeus's dismay. Um, for this crime, Zeus is going to chain him to a rock for the rest of eternity, where every day he's subjected to a whole range of tortures. It's very unpleasant. Um, and there are a number of Prometheus bounds in the sort of artistic canon. Um, I think there's a couple paintings, there's even like an opera, um, but this is her take on it. It's a very interesting take on it. He isn't resigned to his fate. He's not, you know, destroyed or he's not, you know, in this position of agony. He's really sort of standing tall despite it. Um, and his face, you know, he looks so focused, so sort of intently looking out. Um, his hand is really interesting. It looks a little bit like um, on the Sistine Chapel, Adam and God. Um, so there's some artistic illusion there. Um, and it's just a really wonderfully sort of dominating piece. Like this has a wonderful spot in the museum right under these beautiful windows. It really draws your attention to it. And so uh, this is like a pet project of hers. It's never actually made into marble, um, always remaining a plaster, but a really fantastic one. Um, some other stuff on, in terms of its construction. As you can see, some pieces have been lost, some pieces have broken. Um, so when she leaves Germany, everything is left in storage. And it will stay there for about 20 years before finally she has it shipped to America. Um, this whole process of bringing them over is very fraught. So things are gonna get lost and broken, just inevitably. As you can see, she was trying to repair his arm, um, but unfortunately passed away before she was able to complete that. So it's kind of cool. Those are like her fingerprints there on his arm um, that you can see. Another thing is that, you know, Prometheus is a titan. He's the platonic ideal of a man. So you can't just have some dude, you know, pose for this. So uh, all of the little pieces of him are taken from different models to really create this amalgamation of the perfect man, uh, which is very neat. Um, so I'm gonna transition over here to her time in America. So Elizabeth and her husband's um, departure from Germany wasn't completely out of the blue. Um, they had a friend in Thomasville, Georgia, who had sent them letters from this artist colony that he was helping to found saying, oh, I have found heaven on earth, you must come join me. Um, so there was this intent to eventually maybe come to America, but it was certainly not going to be that um, out of the blue, that dramatic. Um, so she and her husband, she's pregnant at the time, they're going to uh, you know, take a boat over to New York where they first arrive. Um, she's gonna have her first son, Arthur, although she does hide her pregnancy. And this is something she also does with her second pregnancy uh, with her son, Lauren. She's going to sort of uh, hide her pregnancy. And then once the child is born, will claim that like they were left at her doorstep. They were these orphans, um, not her own children, which is really bizarre. I mean, that's kind of an odd uh, thing to do even now, but I think this was in sort of service of her general um, discomfort with the idea of being seen as a wife or a mother before her own individual woman. Um, and so that is just a little interesting uh, quirk of hers. Um, so they're going to end up in Georgia, as I said. Uh, this artist colony, it, it needs a lot of work. Um, so they're gonna start out, they build this log castle and actually Elizabeth is gonna be out um, in the heat you know, splitting logs, not even among like her, you know, fellow Germans, all the German men are inside. They're having these hired hands, you know, do the work for them, but not Elizabeth. Elizabeth was intent on helping out, on doing the work, much to everyone's sort of confusion um, and bemusement. Uh, so she's going to help build this log castle that they live in for a little while. Um, however, it quickly becomes obvious that this colony is not exactly what they had been promised. Um, these are artists, not farmers. They don't really know what they're doing in creating this self-sufficient, um, you know, functional society. And so that felt, fall, falls apart fairly quickly. Uh, also, their friend who invited them is going to pass away of an illness, illness caught there. So 
that doesn't work out. So they're gonna start looking outwards and actually Elizabeth bit by herself will go on this solo trip to Texas to sort of start scoping things out. Um, through the German embassy, she's gonna be connected to this property in Hempstead, Texas, which is just outside of Houston. Um, it's a really small town. It's quite a, like, even today, it's, it's barely anything. Back then it was tiny. Um, but she's going to come across this abandoned Civil War era plantation called Leando uh, that she just falls in love with. There's this, you know, event where she rushes out onto the balcony, throws the doors open and says, this is where I shall live and this is where I shall die. So she's very enamored with um, this location and the freedom that it allows her. Uh, so Texas is, you know, even despite being now a state, uh, this is post-Civil War too, it is really kind of uncharted land and it gave you a chance to fully remake oneself. And I think they also really liked the idea of raising their children in this environment as um, she could really mold them into the people that she wanted them to be, you know, with art and culture and all these things like, you know, supporting that. Um, so they're going to purchase Leando and start to sort of try to get it back into functioning order, uh, though they're not great at it. Again, this is the same issue as before. They're artists, not farmers. And so the plantation is never particularly profitable. Um, and in fact, it's gonna be kind of an issue for them later on uh, in that it's like they can't really sell it because they've put so much money into it. So that will sort of hang over them for a long time. Um, however, this does give her that space that she wanted to be her own woman, do her own thing, um, sort of away from the you know, confines of society. However, um, the people of Hempstead, the, the society of Hempstead that she finds herself in has no clue of what to make of her. She is so unlike them in every way. She, um, you know, she has short hair. She has an undefined relationship with the man she lives with, which is very odd. Um, there's this one occasion where she comes into town uh, wearing pants, rode a stride over her horse, which is very provocative rather than, you know, side saddle, which would be much more demure. Um, so she's going to come in and it's just the flurry. I mean, it puts everyone to a flurry. It's the talk of the town for like weeks. They just simply do not know what to make of her. Um, and because of this, she's sort of ostracized. Later, um, some, they're going to be, you know, a, a bit of a tragedy that befalls the family. Um, her oldest son, Arthur, is going to pass away uh, due to diphtheria, which is a highly infectious disease. And her husband, being a doctor, knew that those who had succumbed to that illness had to be cremated. Um, and there are no crematoriums in Hempstead, Texas. So tragically, they have to do it themselves, which is, you know, ghoulish to begin with. But then it's going to get out that, you know, the strange German lady is burning her children in the fireplace. They are going to come to the conclusion that she's a witch. And that just kind of, you know, finalizes her relationship to those um, around her. They just don't really want anything to do with her. She doesn't exactly want anything to do with them because she also kind of views them as like backwards um, beneath her to some degree. Um, but it, it, it is a shame how she's so dismissed. And there is something to be said about the fact that she's a witch, but her husband is in a warlock. He doesn't receive that same... Um, you know, chilly uh, reception that she receives in great part because he's a man. Uh, also, he is a doctor, which is, you know, beneficial to the, the community. So they're not going to completely um, oust him in the way that she, they would her, but there is definitely a bit of misogyny in the way that she is um, just sort of taken by the locals. Um, so now that her sort of social world is a bit closed, um, this does give Elizabeth the time and energy to focus on her great experiment, her surviving son, Lorne. Um, and Lorne is a very interesting man. Uh, they have very conflicting aims. She really wants to, as I said, mold him into this perfect um, man of culture, of art, and he just isn't that person. He does not respond to that. Um, and there are a number of things too that she does that like really doesn't help. So like he is forced to wear togas to school and is beat up by the local boys. Um, he 
is just not really given much time to be himself, um, is also not allowed to play with other children because that would somehow, you know, disrupt his education. So he's not very well socialized, um, just kind of has a range of issues that she sort of accidentally pushes upon him. Um, and this is going to kind of strain the relationship in general. So uh, by the time that he's sort of of an age to start making decisions for himself, they're really in conflict with one another. Um, there is this kind of sad occasion where he's actually going to join Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders um, and she'll come to the barracks. She's going to call him down, make a whole fuss. And then he looks her in the eyes once he finally arrives downstairs and says, I do not know this woman. And that's the last they see of each other for quite a while. Um, so this is a real tragedy to Elizabeth. She really um, believed that motherhood was kind of her way to impact the world. Um, and that, you know, is a disappointment for her. Uh, so instead, she's going to turn to her other passion, her other focus, um, which is art. And she hasn't really been doing art um, for this whole period. There's about 20 years where she only makes one or two pieces, um, one being this portrait of Lorne. Um, but other than that, she really wasn't doing anything, rather was focusing on him and then also trying to keep the farm in working order, uh, which required her to like, you know, she was out in the fields, she was the one helping organize, you know, labor. Um, her husband was writing, he was, he was totally doing his own thing. Um, however, there was always this intention to get back into art as she would always wear gloves that protect your hands from getting calloused because you can't sculpt with calluses. Um, so finally she's going to be able to get back into art and this coincides very well with the Chicago World's Fair which is um, a pretty big deal for Texas they really want to show themselves as um, not just this sort of crazy place full of crazy rugged individualists pioneers frontiersmen etc um, they really want to show themselves as a place with culture with art and um, it's a whole thing. The, the, there's a kind of a mess surrounding this Texas exhibition. Um, there is a group formed to organize the exhibit to get artists, to pay people, etc. But that kind of falls apart. They don't have funding. And then there's just general mismanagement. So the women's organization, which was formed to kind of help them with the little, you know, decorating and like, you know, uh, sort of those minor concerns, the women are actually going to take over and they're going to be the ones to actually, you know, bring about this exhibit. And um, they will be connected to Elizabeth, who is really wanting to get back into art. So these are the pieces that she is commissioned to do for the 1893 Columbian Chicago World's Fair. This is Sam Houston, CNF Austin, the fathers of Texas. Um, just a little background on who they are. Sam Houston is going to be extraordinarily influential in the founding of Texas. He is a general. He's then going to be the first and third presidents of Texas, and then uh, one of the first governors. So very, very influential man. Uh, Stephen F. Austin is not as technically you know, influential um, in and of himself, but will be a very important figure. Um, he is obviously what Austin is named after. So very important individuals, and it's a real honor for her to be given this commission. Um, so it's a big deal, and it's also going to be sort of her first foray back into making art. Um, and luckily, these pieces turn out fairly well, although Sienna Faustin is not completed in time. So only Sam Houston is going to make his way um, to that event, although um, later on they will find other homes, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but Sam Houston is going to be very well lauded as, first, just a very good reproduction of him. He is dead at this point, but she's going to do a lot of research to... Um, get his face right, get his body right. Um, even the artifacts that he's holding are very original. So for example, he's holding this Cherokee blanket um, as he was a, you know, he lived among the Cherokee for quite a few years. That was very important to him. And then also the uh, sword that he holds is original, as is Stephen F. Austin's gun. Um, these are very much direct representations or direct reproductions of actual artifacts. Um, 
Something interesting that she chooses to do with these two pieces is that she doesn't portray them in contemporary dress, which would have been very much the convention. Uh, rather, she shows them in um, deerskin uh, outfits, deerskin suits, which was um, very unique. I mean, that set them apart for sure. And it was an interesting choice. It was kind of a bold choice, but it was very well received. People really liked how she sort of embraced the... Um, psyche of Texas, the, the, the history of Texas in these portraits. So um, as I said, Sam Houston is going to go to the World's Fair. Um, only Sam Houston though, because she just doesn't finish this one in time. And then later on, um, she's going to be commissioned by the uh, Texas government to make um, a marble set of these two for the newly built Texas Capitol, which needed to be filled with art. Um, and so the marble versions of these two pieces sit right as you enter the rotunda at the Capitol, which is a really interesting, I mean, not really interesting, but very honorable position. Um, and lots and lots of folks see them, but not necessarily recognize that it's her, which is kind of a shame. Uh, there also are two marble versions of these at the United States Capitol. And it's very um, telling at their unveiling there are hours of speeches by all these different individuals about how um, fantastic it is to have these fathers of Texas at the um, United States Capitol, um, the, how all of the men who helped found Texas, but there is not one word about Elizabeth Ney. They don't even mention her name. Um, and she's the creator of these pieces. Uh, it just kind of shows that even though she did have some success, there was always this um, cloud or this, this, this um, obstacle of her gender sort of preventing her from really receiving the full recognition she deserved for the work that she did. Um, and this will become an issue in Austin. I mean, she has this initial success, but will find some difficulty asserting herself. Despite the lack of recognition she gets, um, she will receive a fairly sizable commission um, for these pieces, which will pay for this building. So she receives $33,000 for Sam Houston and Stephen F. Austin, which is a very sizable amount of money. Um, and that is going to pay for the first half of our building, which is these two rooms. Later on, about 10 years later, she's gonna add the second half, which includes a um, tower study that's really beautiful, as well as just more space for her to work in. And something notable at this house is that it is a studio first and a home second. Um, so for example, there's no dedicated bedroom. She would often sleep on the roof in a cot that we have upstairs that she made herself from beams that she cut outside, um, most likely in the nude because uh, that was just her style. And um, this is just sort of generally a, a good example of the way she lived here in Austin. Um, Today, we are located in Hyde Park, which is very central Austin. I mean, this is, you know, uh, Austin by every definition, but at the time, this was kind of the boonies. This was out there. Um, she was surrounded by farms on all sides. It was very rugged. And so here she is, this extraordinary, bizarre German woman, um, pretty much by herself as uh, Ludwig, or I'm sorry, Edmund, uh, stayed primarily in Hempstead managing the farm while she lived here. So they kind of lived apart for most of their end of their life um, due to sort of a mutual agreement that that's what they each needed for their careers, for their finances. Um, but so here she is by herself. Um, and it's a really fantastic building. Uh, if you ever get a chance to visit, we would love to have you. It's sort of a limestone castle is the way it's often described um, because she's going to take these sort of neoclassical sensibilities that she would have been seeing in Germany, um, such as like, you know, these beautiful uh, towers and like awnings and things of that sort. Um, but she's going to use a very distinctively Texan palette of this limestone, exposed limestone, uh, which was only really used for barns. I mean, this was kind of an odd looking building even at the time, and it's pretty small, it's not, it's not huge. Um, it is a very sensible home and quite austere, honestly, especially compared to um, where she would have been living for in Germany, for example. But this was really where, this was the ideal environment for her to create her art. And so, um, 
this place is built and she lives here for the last 15 or so years of her life. Um, this is also going to serve as a wonderful place for her to sort of form her little community here in Austin. She's going to have these salons um, on the back lawn of uh, the home right next to Lake Ney, as Waller Creek used to be called, um, where you know all of these intellectuals, artists would come and talk about um, you know politics and philosophy and all of the things that she was sort of deprived of in Hempstead. So it's really fantastic the community that she finds here um, that that really embraces her, that really understands um, her unique. Um, magic and her 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 just sort of fantastic um, personality. Um, she really blossoms in that way here in Austin. Is actually going to introduce the idea of a salon to Austin. Um, however, she will face some sort of you know professional trouble in that. Um, first of all, Texas doesn't really have a concept of fine art. And so she's going to have a lot of trouble sort of impressing upon people um, what good taste is when it comes to monuments, um, how much art should cost. Um, these are things that she sort of has to introduce the Texans to. Also, she does face quite a bit of pushback due to her age. Um, she's about 60 at the time. And of course, as is the theme throughout her life because of her gender. So for example, there is this um, young Italian named Pompeo Capini who's going to come in uh, a bit after her and start sort of disrupting uh, the, the, the community. He's going to actually like say to people, like, you don't want that old woman doing your piece. Um, let me take these commissions. And in fact, he will gain a lot of the commissions that she then loses because of him. Um, so this you know, conflict between uh, her and the sort of traditional art world that she's escaping there in Germany, it follows um, and will kind of create some difficulty. An interesting ally that she finds is the women of Texas. Um, so many of the, the women that she becomes friends with, that she becomes companions with, are the wives of famous men. And so she will do many of their pieces, but the more significant you know, profitable pieces are going to be these um, portraits of Texas's great men, great politicians. So here we have governors, we have generals, we have senators, some very important individuals. And it does, you know, eventually become quite an honor to have your piece done by Miss Ney. She wasn't completely dismissed. Um, and we'll have a fairly successful career in that she's recognized here, but not necessarily profitable. Um, she has some funny quotes where she's like, if I owe you money, do not come, for I have none. So money was always tight. Um, but in any case, she will find a very hospitable community for herself here in Austin. Um, she's also going to get involved in a number of like social, um, political, sort of activist um, you know, uh, 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 exploits. So for example, she's a very strong suffragette. She's going to um, organize here in this building a number of, you know, protests, um, talks to the legislator, uh, encouraging them to, you know, extend the right to vote to women. Um, unfortunately, she will not live to see suffrage for women. However, many of her protégés will. And um, she has a very important role here in Texas in that way. She's also going to be a huge advocate for education. So one very cool example of this is that uh, Prairie View A&M is gonna be founded as one of the state's first historically black colleges. And originally it was intended just to be a technical school, um, but Elizabeth and Edmund both highly, highly um, advocated for there to be a liberal arts education there as well. So she's going to succeed in sort of diversifying what is offered there um, for the students, which is awesome. She also is going to uh, work quite a bit to encourage art programs, uh, both at UT, and then she tries to do one here in Austin that's independent of that. Doesn't really work out, but Formosa, this building, so it's called Formosa, um, is going to be the site of quite a lot of you know young artist education as she takes them under her wing, she makes them her assistants, um, and is going to, you know, many of them are gonna go on to do their own great art. Uh, so that's really fantastic. Uh, so this piece here is Lady Macbeth. This is the last piece Elizabeth is going to complete in her lifetime. Um, and it's, in my opinion, one of her best. It's just so evocative. I mean, 
if you look at her face, it is so sort of twisted into this, you know, expression of um, discontent, of, of sort of agony even, if you know the context, this is the O oh spot scene, um, or oh damned spot, I believe. Uh, her neck, like you can see the muscles, um, her hands, the way they're clasped, and kind of in my favorite way, the, uh, the way the, the, the fabric drapes as she steps down, it's just incredible. Um, and something I love about this piece is that her face, it's not necessarily conventionally beautiful. In fact, it's kind of a masculine face, actually. Um, however, the emotion that it evokes is so true to the piece, and it's so evocative um, that I really, I really admire Elizabeth's ability to put aside sort of plain beauty for the sake of artistic meaning. Um, and that's something that I think she uh, really flirted with a lot. Um, although, yes, she does do primarily portraits, there is so much in those portraits. And the way that she captures the individual, I think, is just remarkable. Um, and, you know, it should be lauded, even if it is just some dude, you know, uh, because she gave it her spin. And the fact that she ends on this one, I think, is very important um, because she's sort of closing it with a version of herself in some ways. You know, she did have this great personality. She was so charismatic. Um, people really loved her, especially here in Austin, but there was a lot of sadness there, especially regarding her difficulties with her son. Um, she and Edmund kind of did have a little bit of strain on their relationship later in their lives um, as he was in, you know, Hempstead. She was here uh, just because, you know, there was so much here that she needed to do that didn't exactly include him. So there was a little conflict there that they did definitely love each other. Um, so I think it's very, this piece is very close to her heart in a way that some of these other ones may not have been. Um, yes, so she's going to pass away at the age of 74 in 1907 um, due to a number of things. There is sort of this complicating factor that um, throughout her whole life, she's been inhaling marble dust, which is really bad for your lungs and kind of is almost like sort of silicosis. Um, so that is going to sort of compromise the rest of her system. And she's going to have a heart attack that sort of incapacitates her. She'll die about a month later. Um, interestingly enough, her husband will outlive her, despite the fact that he had tuberculosis. Um, he will, I think, outlive her by about three years. Um, but he's not really in any position to sort of take care of her legacy in the way that it deserves to be taken care of. So a group of 119, it's the number, of her friends and companions are going to kind of pull together to bring out the money to um, turn this place into a museum, into an education space. Um, and they will succeed. They're going to buy it from him in 1911 and create the museum that we're in today. Um, it is one of, if not the, first art museums in Texas. It is also potentially one of the first art museums dedicated to a woman in the United States, if not the world. So there's a lot of history there. This is a very significant location, um, in my opinion, at least. And, you know, it's significant in that it continues her legacy, which is so remarkable, is so um, complex. Um, I think there's something for everybody in here in that like, you know, she was at her core, you know, this modern woman refused to be confined to the limiting boxes of mother, wife, woman. She really broke out of that. So there's that. Um, she's also, you know, as a young woman, she, you know, fought against um, the expectations of those around her. As an older woman, she restarted her career at the age of 60. Um, she was an immigrant. She was a suffragette. She was an abolitionist. She was so many things. And um, I think that this place um, really, you know, carries that forward. Um, and I am very grateful to work here to, um, you know, be surrounded by this presence. Um, so yes, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much to the Smithsonian for organizing this gender equity and youth event. I am a youth interested in gender equity, so it's great to be able to participate. Um, and yeah, so thank you so much for listening. Have a good one. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the tour. For our discussion tonight, we've asked Dr. Janet Davis to be our moderator. 
Janet M. Davis is a professor of American Studies and History at the University of Texas at Austin. She is the author of The Gospel of Kindness, Animal Welfare, and the Making of Modern America, Oxford University Press 2016. The Circus Age, Culture and Society Under the American Big Top, UNC Press 2002. And the editor of Circus Queen and Tinkerbell, The Life of Tiny Klein, University of Illinois Press 2008. She has won multiple prizes for her scholarship and teaching. She regularly serves as a humanities consultant, most recently for the award-winning documentary miniseries, The Circus, which aired nationally on PBS in 2018 and is now streaming on Netflix worldwide. Her teaching is focused on animal welfare, US social movements, and women's and gender history. Dr. Davis has kindly helped us assemble a group of first year students from the University of Texas at Austin to join us this evening. These students have watched the video and will respond to questions that Dr. Davis has prepared for the conversation. Without further ado, I hand the floor to Janet. Thank you so much, Oliver, for your generous introduction. And hello to everyone today. It is a pleasure to be here with my students, all of whom are members of the Plan to Honors program at UT Austin. We are delighted to participate in the 2021 National Youth Summit held in collaboration between the Smithsonian Institution and the Elizabeth Ney Museum here in Austin. And the Ney Museum is an affiliate museum of the Smithsonian. And thanks so much to the Smithsonian to Oliver Franklin, Lindsay Barris, Trevor Smith, and Annie Franklin of the Ney Museum for making tonight's conversation possible. And thanks to my students for being here too. And using this year's theme of the National Youth Summit is gender equity. And we're gonna use this theme as the foundation of our discussion this evening, which is gonna explore the remarkable life and work of the groundbreaking German-American sculptor, Elisabeth Ney, who was born in Münster, Germany in 1833 and died at the age of 74 in 1907 at her studio and home in Austin, Texas. Tonight's discussion is gonna be based on the a film that the museum has produced and the students and I have watched this film and it is a really great, exciting document of an amazing life. And so with gender equity as the foundation of our discussion, we're going to begin. And I should note that the Ney Museum is the first art museum in Texas. So welcome everyone. I wanna start our discussion with some kind of analysis from everyone regarding Ney's amazing childhood and to think about her in maybe ways that, you know, we can think about as potentially using modern language as gender non-conforming. And so I would love to hear from students in what ways was her childhood marked by gender non-conformity? So I, anyone can speak if anyone wants to raise their hand or just start speaking either way. I thought it was really interesting in comparison to my life because when I think about how my journey through matriculate, matriculation has been supported by my community and my parents, it's almost an abstract idea to me that my gender could be something that holds me back from reaching education or holds me back from achieving achieving yeah. greater things in life. So to think that on top of the immense struggles that we face going through matriculation, to have that be one of them is so remarkable, especially when it comes to fine arts, because that's such a specific zone where gender differences and gender equity have such a large role to play in the way that success is like tainted by society. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I mean, think about the drama of her experience. You know, she announces to her parents, you know, her father's 
a stonemason and a, you know she comes from a long line of artists in her family and she says i want to go i want to become a sculptor and i want to study in berlin and they're like no way <laughs> you can't do that and so what does she do she has a hunger strike and so you know it is right nicholas it's amazing like to think about how you know her desire to do something like this is greeted with such pushback from her family but even as a kid i mean there are things that she does that you know like she cuts her hair um you know she wears unusual clothing and what is she you know what kind of path do you think she was trying to forge for herself as you know knowing that her life you know per the expectations of her society in Germany and certainly elsewhere too, were dictating that she should grow up, become a Hausfrau, married with children, and her primary focus is going to be on those two worlds. So what does like cutting her hair, what does that do to suggest something potentially different? How does that speak to her family? I think maybe the sort of like cutting her hair when she was younger sort of started paving the way for her attitude of like doing what she wants and figure, like finding a means to do it yeah um, which I don't think was very encouraged especially for women at the time and that kind of set not the tone just for her own life but for like future as well and like yeah. that sort of attitude of I have something in mind I want to do I'm going to go do it sort of progressed as like she was a kid and then she moved on to like getting the matricula whole matriculation process the hunger strike and then as soon as she started doing busts of men and um the people that she wanted to do and she chose them and it's sort of almost it's almost like she wanted to do the busts of men make sculpts of them and a lot of them might not have wanted that to happen and she was able to convince them starting with a priest which i thought was part of the coolest part of the video we watched that she was able to convince uh, the church which generally isn't very lenient um so a member of the church to persuade her parents to let her go to art school um and then able to like even convince some misogynistic men of her sort of point of view, letting and in the end, letting them, letting her do a bust of them, um, which I thought was pretty special. Totally. Yeah, that was really interesting. And I mean, definitely, you know, her, the bishop is like this key figure, as you just mentioned, Ion, to, you know, to kind of navigating the process of her actually going to school you know, like Berlin, I want to go to Berlin, but well, let's go to, let's go to Munich instead. It's, you know, it's a Catholic city. It's more conservative. Maybe we can kind of chart a path that kind of makes this acceptable to all parties. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's fascinating. So one question I have for you about kind of thinking about sculpting as an artist versus being a watercolorist or some other kind of artistry, artist, um, why is sculpting so potentially transgressive for a young woman? What are some of the things, you know, just thinking about the act of being a sculptor? Well, sculpting requires a lot more um, bodily work as opposed to a more like passive form of art, which is what painting would be. And I think that's something that um, her society at that time really viewed as a more masculine task. So um, her, her pursuing sculpting was a very direct way of her going against those societal norms. Uh, also with her uh, cutting her hair and changing her appearance, which I would like to also note uh, for me at least, it appears to be the most direct way of transforming yourself especially as a first impression so with this uh sculpting it's kind of um it's almost shocking at the time that like a woman can channel her passion into what is traditionally considered as like a masculine task yeah yeah for sure um yeah. isabel uh, oh, oh if i could um, wants to go first yeah <laughs> Um, that's all right. Uh, I was also just going to talk about kind of the subject of her sculpting. She talked, um, we talked a lot about how she, uh, mainly deals with the human form mm -hmm. and, um, 
I, don't, I just had the thought that um, kind of a woman dealing with the human form suggests a kind of ownership over that body, which yeah. uh, generally with a male gaze in art at the time, that wouldn't be something, uh, that wouldn't be a privilege she would have. Yeah, I think that's a really, really important point, you know, that kind of power of, you know, the male gaze and certainly um, the fact that there she is gazing at these bodies as she is sculpting them in ways that could be very, very, you know, very much beyond um, what society expects she should be doing as a woman. Yeah, Annie, I wanted to let you speak too. Yeah, so like I said, there was that kind of funny little, you know, quip about like, oh, she wasn't allowed to take anatomy class with the men and said she was given a dead cow. That is true. Yes. But the reason for that was because like you were saying, like a woman viewing the nude body among these men would have just been too far. So she, even like in the, just like, you know, practice and like um, education of her craft, she was still facing, you know, roadblocks because again, it was too much. And I really like what you're saying, Isabel, about like the ownership thing um, because, you know, it just was not something women did and it required a lot more study um, not to say that painting or something of that sort doesn't require the same amount of detail, but like to really stare at the body and to really look at the muscles and look at the, you know, way the flesh falls. Like that's something that sculpting really requires that other forms may not. Yeah. And it's a three-dimensional, you know, form of, of, of creating. And so that also, you know, the kind of physicality of sculpture makes it even more kind of of the body, you know, in some ways than other kinds of artistic work. Yeah. So um, did Lucas, did you have a, did you have your hand raised? I thought I saw uh, I did, but we already kind of touched on it. So Cecily okay. has your hand raised. So. Okay, great. Yes, yeah, Cecily. Yeah, sculpting just seems to be such a more like intimate, yeah. um, mode of art which I guess was really like emphasized in her life and like when we watched the video about the cow like I don't know that was so interesting that instead of like looking at a body and actually studying like the human form they just decided to give her a cow of all things yeah I know I was really taken by the cow too and, you know, and the other thing too, when you think about the kind of scientific context of how women were, you know, considered in this era of science, you know, too, as kind of hysterical beings who were emotional and unstable and, you know, that, that kind of that kind of proximity to bodies could be something that would be far more dangerous, you know, and then she's just saying, no. <laughs> I've got this, I can do this. So absolutely, you know, I think there's so much going on um, that she's pushing back on as an artist. Yeah, Harish. Yeah, I wanted to touch on the same thing you were just now talking about, like her determination to me is what came across as uh, like something, I don't know, it was just very powerful to me because you had to imagine like how many times she'd probably got told, what, you wanna be a sculptor, what? Yeah or like something along those lines. And she still stuck through with it. She still was like, I wanna do this, I'm, I'm gonna make it. And that that's just something that I felt was very powerful. Yeah, I know, I found that really remarkable too. This sense of like, I kind of don't care, I'm gonna do this. <laughs> yeah, Nick. And even going back to the way that we were talking about anatomy and the way yeah. that she interacts with the gender in that way, it's really interesting to me how she seems to blend the lines between subject and artist. Like at this time period, I mean, in our history, there's such a, a fraught connection between nudity and art. And in this time period, we're right in between like Ingres and Manet's great nudes. And we're at a point where we associate the subject of the nude or of the anatomy to be female and to be something that's viewed. But the idea that the female will be creating that work is almost so unprecedented and so groundbreaking that it can't really be accepted in that lens and I, I think that's just really a testament to the way that Nay like has almost taken over the role of the artist and the subject at once in a way that couldn't be understood. 
I think so. It gets back to Isabel's point about the gaze too, and the power of, you know, kind of, you know, this kind of transgressive kind of switch in a way from subject, you know, to active agent of, you know, representing men, you know, in a way that was very, very unusual for the time. Yeah, Lucas and then Danny. Uh, yeah, so going back to Harisha, uh... I thought it was interesting how uh, she's kind of like her determination was kind of something that like pushed her through her entire life. Like she was she, when she when she started talking about like oh she's moved to America and she's in this, like artist like commune and then she's moved to Texas and now she's they're kind of like building up this homestead kind of like redoing it and they have like no experience doing any of this. I just thought it was interesting how she was so determined in every single like everything that came up in her life like whether it's like her art or like her like education or like being a mother. Like, I just thought it was like really like just something that's kind of inspiring. Yeah, definitely. You know, she is really the definition of being extremely resilient. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. Danny. I just want to add on to what points have already been made, yeah. but I thought that her trailblazing from going from someone who wasn't even allowed into sculpting school to sculpting, to learning from just a cow's body all the way to um, asking very prominent men in her society, which is something that was unprecedented. And then as well as her own, um, her own family structure and how she made her own way in that as well. Yeah, and that is something we definitely need to talk about her family. I wanna circle back really quickly to a point that Annie has made in the chat. And this is the point of how some people you know, really considered to, her to be an oddity or a novelty. And I wanted to ask you about if, you know, her, for the time, gender non-conforming hair, her, you know, wearing um, a dress that's really, you know, this is the age of the corset. And she's wearing smocks that are loose. And then, of course, when she moves to the United States in Texas, in Hempstead, Texas, she's wearing pants. And she's riding a stride. She's not riding a dainty ladylike side saddle when she's riding. I mean, she's doing all these kinds of transgressive, you know, very kind of public displays of like, here I am. But I'm wondering if to push back on, you know, kind of the, the, the sense that she was a novelty or an oddity, do you think in any way that the way that she presented herself to the world was a kind of defense in a way that would it render her in some ways less transgressive to just be considered, you know, like she's, it's hard to describe who she is or what she is as opposed to if she was this heavily corseted, you know, high hair piled on top of her head kind of, you know, representative femininity in the studio. I mean, I imagine it would have been really uncomfortable to be sitting and sculpting that long, but you know, I'm curious, are there reasons that that, you know, that these choices um, also in a way could help her establish her legitimacy? And I know that was a really long question. Yes, Lucas. Uh, yeah, I think also like, so like, I think something that is also like important is like her kind of her relationship and how that's also like free and kind of like non-conforming like they're not like actually married they don't tell anybody like they don't she doesn't take his last name and all of that I mean it's like something that she she kind of does a lot in life and is that she just goes against the grain and kind of just doesn't tell anyone and just does whatever she wants and it's kind of like her like way of like rebelling is that she's just going to do whatever she wants like no matter what anybody says mm -hmm. yeah yeah absolutely yeah Annie yeah, and to connect that idea of like her marriage and then also her like whole impression, I think in a way, um, so when you were, when you became a wife, that became your whole identity, that became yeah. who you were, that became what you represented, that became the person you were associated with. And yeah. so by remaining within this sort of state of like, you know, it's like, it's like how Artemis like chose to be the virgin goddess because it kind of granted her more control over her life. I think Elizabeth yeah. does that the same way too, because um, she knows that if she becomes a wife, she'll become a wife first and an artist second. And, you know, even then it's like, 
they would take their husband's name. So it'd be like Mrs. Uh, Edmund Montgomery. There's no way to form an identity as an artist um, to get commissions, to get recognition when you're your husband's name. That's what you are. So I think in staying within this weird space of like, are they, are they not married? She really forged her own identity. Absolutely. Miss Nay, Mr. M Montgomery, you know, this kind of, it, it's, it's so powerful in that context of maintaining kind of the primacy of her identity and keeping that identity. Rhea. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that, especially because, um, well, I, I feel like her marriage or her not identifying it as a traditional marriage and also her a very untraditional appearance, all that kind of set the tone for the rest of her life in the sense that she was not going to conform to anything. So the only thing that you can expect from her is the unexpected. So in that mm -hmm. sense, it's kind of like, it does give her more freedom, especially with that element of surprise that she's always carrying with her. It, you never know what she's going to do next. So the only thing you can do is watch. Right. The only thing you can do is keep paying attention. Yeah, because she's because you don't know what she's going to do. Yeah. And what about, you know, thinking about the way that she thought about motherhood and concealing her pregnancies and making, you know, up these stories of these children being orphans or, you know, this this kind of reframing a narrative of motherhood in this society. Um, you know, what, what did you make of that? What did that, what did, what did that allow her to do, she and her husband to do, if anything? Were they able to make friends in these communities in Georgia and in East Texas? Um, you know, what was the kind of, how was, how was this, you know, this mother received. Uh, like, yeah. I mean, I don't really, I don't really have much to say about like, her concealing it more than like, I think it's kind of like helps conceal the relationship further. Uh, but like, and I remember she was like received poorly as a mother and like her son, like, I kind of, I guess kind of disowned her. I'm, I'm not sure yeah. if that's like the right word, but that seems like fitting. And I think that was like something that was really like upsetting. And it's kind of like, I kind of feel like feeling of like failure, I guess, because she kind of pushed and she like determined, she kind of like accomplished most everything she put her mind to. And that was something that like she really couldn't conquer. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a really, really good point. I mean, the sense that, you know, she idealized with her second child. And I do want to talk about her firstborn too, who passes away as a young child from diphtheria. You know, that's just a horrific set of events. Um, and I think that's one of the most powerful moments in the film too. Um, but, you know, Lauren, her second son, she dresses him up in a toga. She, you know, takes, she really idealizes this kind of creative force. And he's like, no, um, you know, he, when he's an adult, he joins the Rough Riders with, the, you know, Theodore Roosevelt. So there's a lot of gender kind of conflict going on in that relationship too. And so, you know, if anyone wants to think about or talk more about that, we can certainly leave a space for that. And, you know, and the other part of this too, in the chat that Annie's mentioning too, is about her, you know, when her son, her firstborn, Arthur dies of diphtheria, you know, they burn the body because of the medical practices of the day. There are no crematoriums in the area in this very rural world that they live in. And thus, this is what they're left to do. And the fact that the community doesn't really, really have any comment about Mr. Montgomery's behavior, Dr. Montgomery's behavior, but Miss Nay, on the other hand, they don't know what to do with her. And I'm curious, like the way that she is branded, especially as a witch, what do you make of that, you know, in terms of thinking about women and power and, you know, accusations of witchcraft historically? 
Can we tie what happens here in any way to other, you know, episodes of, of witchery and, you know, declarations of, you know, accusations of being a witch at other times in history? I thought it was really interesting because um, the way that society reacted to her radical femininity and her radical self-expression was almost to say that you aren't even a woman in our ideas. You're rather a witch. You're something that we as humans can't comprehend as something that's real to us. And therefore we're going to cast you off and make you seem like some fabled figure that that almost explains or justifies your behavior, right? It's like a woman doesn't do this, that, this, that, or that. So therefore you simply aren't one of us. You aren't even really a human. And I thought it was, it's, it's really shocking and sad how quick society can be to label, like to dehumanize people for being different. But I think it, it gives more, more reason to believe that she was just so noteworthy and that she was so proud and passionate and being herself that society was so quick to label her as a witch, which is a pretty strong condemnation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I uh, Yeah, I just it, not just like I think when we think of witch, we kind of all think of the Salem witch trials, but for even beyond more beyond that at, at this sort of time and prior to it, yeah. women who were powerful or I guess um, revolutionary or not even those maybe just unorthodox, like a little different in some way. Yeah. They were often branded as witches, like even in Europe, like European cultures, yeah. that stuff kind of happened. That's kind of the go-to for people who are, for women who are out of their, I guess, ahead of their time, maybe. Um, and this kind of like, it, it reminded me a little bit of what we were talking about earlier about her sort of, I guess, failure as a mother for a second child, because she didn't really fit into that. She didn't really, I guess her son didn't get along with her as much. But um, I think as she was branded a witch, like the psychological effects kind of push you, she wanted to push away sort of the femininity of herself, um, mm -hmm. which again, the like the norms of being a woman at that time, so marrying, she didn't get married normally. She was sort of in a relationship, but it wasn't a formal marriage, right? There was no oath or anything. Um, and I think motherhood is sort of a part of that, which is why I think part of her reason, part of the reason that motherhood didn't come to her as naturally as it might have is because she sort of wanted to push that side of her away and that's kind of because of the branding that sort of happened through society in terms of labeling her a witch, in terms of not letting her be a woman that she wanted to be, sort of wanting to be the woman that everybody else around her wanted to be. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and one could argue that, you know, she did want to be a wife and mother, but on her own terms, you know. So but she, she wanted to be known as herself first exactly. and her like with her own accomplishments, not not that, oh, she's an accomplishment because she got married or because she was able to have kids. She was an accomplishment because of her ability to be a sculptor first and then all the other stuff next. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly it. Yeah, Rhea. Oh, it's Rhea. But Rhea, um, sorry. Also, no problem. Um, another thing is that throughout history, especially in like the Salem Witch Trials as well, yeah. like the label of a witch is almost a tactic of how like to keep women in line it's like a warning especially um for noteworthy figures um, like her who would just be like if she's successful she cannot possibly be um human she can't be someone to be looked up to so we have to label her as a witch to make sure everyone else um keeps in line and to keep this person in line as well so that's just something throughout history. And that's also something that is prevalent in this situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A way to contain strong women. And, you know, sometimes with deadly force in the case of the Salem witch trials and so many other instances, you know, of accusations and, um, you know, that could have really violent consequences to women. Absolutely. Isabel. Oh, um, I just, found it really interesting how this kind of system of class and uh, gender kind of necessitates that she adopts these more masculine characteristics or more traditionally masculine characteristics um, in order for her to find success because if she um, continued to perform um, a femininity uh, to a greater degree, she would have been rejected 
she would have been rejected from art school. So it kind of necessitates that she become this outcast because the women in Texas can't see her as a traditional woman that fits into the group um, in this way, um, in these roles as a mother and a wife, uh, but she can't, she also can't fully be accepted by the men because her success is um, a threat in a way. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I think all of these are really, really good points, you know, that the way she comports herself is a statement of, you know, this is what she's going to be. Yeah, Nick. Yes, I definitely agree with that. And I think that more about being the witch, it's just about containment. And I was thinking about it and I was reminded of my favorite writer who is Virginia Woolf and in A Room of One's Own, just a really good line that I'll drop in the chat about how when we perceive people who are labeled as witches or as like being possessed by devils, it's because they have this effervescence that leaves their body that is so influential, that is so noteworthy that it causes other people to want to contain them because they don't know how to interpret their gifts and they don't know how to interpret their presence. And so I, I wanted to make a literary connection because I feel like Virginia Woolf has a very strong presence in this conversation. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. I love the quote, it's just wonderful. Um, yeah, it, 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 it went, I'm, I'm just gonna read it because it's so good. And I think a, a broader audience would love it if they don't see it. When however one reads of a witch being ducked of a woman possessed by devils of a wise woman selling herbs or even of a very remarkable man who had a mother, then I think we are on the track of a lost novelist, a suppressed poet of some mute and inglorious Jane Austen, some Emily Bronte who dashed her brains out on the moor or mopped and mowed about the highways crazed with the torture that her gift had put her to. Indeed, I would venture to guess that Anon, who wrote so many poems without signing them, was often a woman. And that brings me to another point in her life is thinking about Austin and thinking about the life that she builds in Austin when she comes in the early 1890s. Um, and I'm thinking specifically, you know, I definitely want to talk about kind of the world she builds for herself, but thinking about poems without signing them makes me think about those works of hers, of Stephen F. Austin and Sam Houston in the state capital of Texas that have no attribution to her. That to me is really a powerful kind of erasure, even though the commission that she was paid by the Texas legislature allowed her to create her studio. It gave her, you know, some degree of financial solvency in her life that allowed her to build a home for herself. Yeah, Annie. Yeah, I can't exactly remember if I said this in the tour, but, you know, when these statues are unveiled, there's hours and hours of speeches about the great men, Sam Houston, Cena, Faustin, the men who made Texas, the men who, you know, allowed this sculpture to happen, but not once is her name mentioned. Um, and that's kind of a theme is that she makes these great works that are lauded, um, but she's not recognized for them. She may be recognized as this wacky lady who lives on the side of town and wears pants, but she's not necessarily given full recognition as this incredible artist. Um, it's really, she's known in the ways that she differs from the normal woman. And um, it's a real shame that she doesn't get very much recognition even today, you know, like old, she's not very well known outside of Texas or even Austin. Um, so it's, great to be able to like you know continue that legacy forward because she, she just didn't have much success in doing that even in her time mm -hmm. yeah erasure you know thinking about gender equity i mean erasure is a really powerful force of kind of containment um and it's it's still with us yeah cecily i think that this kind of like loops back to the whole witch thing because I think that a really big push during all of that was them just condemning the people that they were uncomfortable with. And I think that like society, when she released these statues were just, it was just so uncomfortable with the idea that a woman could create such 
an impressive, you know, like sculpture. And so I think that they just really try to keep it out of everybody's knowledge so that they wouldn't be uncomfortable with it, which is a huge shame. Yeah. And I mean, I really appreciate what you're saying because, you know, this emphasis and all this speechifying at the Capitol is about these fathers of Texas. And if they are, you know, created by a woman, <laughs> what does that do to that narrative of this kind of great men of Texas? <laughs> yeah. Rhea. Um, I'd also like to point out that it's kind of like taking advantage of her in a way by not recognizing her work. And then there's also, um, well, the way that you worded the question, Professor Davis, is like they allowed her to do it, which right. implies that there's there's already no room for women in this area. So anything they're going to do is to allow her to do it. And any like, so what they don't allow, what they're restricting her to is them exerting their like, force and their power over her and taking advantage of her talents when really she should be able to um, kind of build her way up or like showcase her talents the way that she wants to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. This whole containment process of being allowed to um, or being erased for that matter is, yeah, it's such a, it's such a central part of, of kind of these this patriarchal society reckoning with this person, reckoning with her. Um, so, you know, so there is this, but yet there's also in Austin a kind of community that she finds here. And I wanted to come to that and discuss that. Um, this is the first time in her life that to me, it seems that she finds a really great vibrant circle of friends and builds a kind of creative community for herself. And I wanted to ask, like, what made that possible, do you think? Why could she do that here? What did her life in Austin allow for that, you know, living on this old plantation in East Texas or living in Georgia or living in Germany for that matter, really didn't provide for her? Yeah, it's just true that Austin has always been a pretty cool place, like <laughs> a, you know, lightning rod of ideas, of intellectuals, of artists. Um, there's also money here, which meant that she could have like a successful career. Um, so it really was like a good place for her to be, um, both for her career. And then, as you said, socially, she really finds people who understand her and admire her. And then she's able to sort of impart her wisdom upon them. So like I said, um, she kind of gives a lot of these like, you know, politicians, wives, um, or just, you know, normal people, like these women who didn't really think that they could do these things. And they see Elizabeth now doing these things and say, well, maybe I can, you know, become a sculptor. Maybe I can, you know, form an organization to encourage the arts in Texas. Like she really inspires them. Um, and there's a receptive audience here. That's, it's, this Austin was needed Elizabeth Nay to come in and sort of spark them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she's a real catalyst, I think, you know, for bringing people together. Um, and she has a place to do it. I think that's, you know, that's something that is worth discussing too. The fact that she has her studio, her home. Um, it's a place that she builds. It's not her husband's place. So that too, I think is really significant. Harish. Yeah, I, I just wanted to like emphasize what you both just said. And it's like, she was the cat. She was a catalyst for Austin in a way. Like when she came to Austin, she definitely inspired so many people to go along with her. And that's how she made like such, group, like such a good group of friends. And so they are all able to inspire each other and help each other get better along the way if I'm on the right track, so. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I think too, another part of that too is, you know, think about the contrast of the legislature, you know, at the state capitol, essentially erasing her authorship of these incredible works of art. And yet, you know, when she dies in 1907, her friends rally, you know, 119 of them rally to make sure that she is remembered. 
And to me, that's a very powerful kind of statement of, you know, reclaiming her identity in many respects. Um, so yeah, Nick. Yeah, I agree. Um, there's a quote that I like that it's, um, you only die when people stop saying your name. And it, it almost reminded me that the way that she imparted her knowledge and her wisdom almost allowed her story to continue to touch generations down the road. I mean, the fact that we're here right now is proof. And that was something that was really inspiring to me. Yeah. And, you know, thinking about what you just said, too, in relation to her political work, I think is also really important, you know, thinking that she was very active in suffrage. And, you know, even though she did not personally lead, you know, live to see the ratification um, of the suffrage amendment, um, you know, people she worked with and mentored did. And so that's something that's really important, I think, as a legacy of her of her life. And then the other piece of this too, thinking politically, is her real devotion and passion for education. You know, thinking about her own life experiences, but then thinking about um, the establishment of Prairie View A and M University, which is a you know historically black university. And you know, there was a real kind of push and pull politically during this era among um, civil rights activists. You know, those who were more in the Booker T. Washington camp believed that technical training for African Americans was the best kind of path to mobility, whereas other civil rights leaders like W.E.B. Du Bois believed that a full liberal arts plan to education was the way to build one's place in the world. And Nay was part of the Du Boisian tradition of, you know, believing in education. So I think that, you know, that stands as another realm that is so important in marking her life and marking kind of her um, struggles and fight for gender equity um, in her lifetime and beyond. So really important. So I think, you know, one other question just to kind of think kind of collectively about her life, her legacy. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are in terms of framing her experiences intersectionally. You know, so when we think about gender and we think about race and ethnicity and class, and we think of them really in a way defining each other, um, are there ways that we can kind of think about Nay's life and her work um, along a more intersectional lens? Does anyone want to take a take a, a try at that? Um, kind of thinking about her as an intersectional human being and her meaning. She comes from. A Can you explain what you mean by an intersectional? Yeah. Intersectional so, so intersectionalism is, um, you know, it's a, it is a way of thinking about um, different categories of identity, um, not in isolation from one another, but in shaping each other. Okay. So thinking about Nay as a German immigrant, she's white. She comes from a particular social class. Um, she is female, identifies as female, and all of these different parts of her identity shape each other. That's, that's what I'm getting at. And so I'm curious if you have thoughts about that kind of, um, you know, thinking about her place um, in the world as an artist and, you know, in her relationships with others. Yeah, so in terms of class, like it's really interesting. A lot of artists of that time uh, would have most likely come from money because that was just, you know, yeah. it was dependable. It was reliable. You knew that you could support this sort of, you know, it's hard to be an artist today. Back then yeah. it was well. Um, and so for her not to come from, you know, I mean, they were middle class, but it wasn't like she had her life set out. She could do whatever she wanted. It was a real risk for her to choose to pursue sculpting um, as her career, even though, you know, 
it, she, she, she really kind of went out on a limb there uh, in a way that a lot of her contemporaries would not have had to worry about it. She has this quote where she's like, um, if I owe you money, do not come for I have none. So money was an issue for her and yes. like something to be sort of recognized with her like life. Yeah, I read that she actually posted that in a newspaper you know, like to any creditors who are after her, you know, just like, look, I'm just going to say it right now. Don't, because I don't have the money. And I think you're right. You know, the association of a certain elite um, kind of comfort in the world of the arts. I mean, not only is she, you know, she's female, she's also not rich, um, not poor either, but, you know, definitely those are two points of, you um, you know, that really mark her as different in, in her life. Um, and also, you know, she's an immigrant too. And I think that's something to be thinking about, um, you know, her kind of sense of being an outsider as an artist um, in Germany, um, but also, you know, in that kind of literal sense of coming from someplace else um, to America in some ways as a political refugee in some ways, you know, just given the fact that she's, she's got, you know, she knows people who are involved in both sides of the conflict in the, you know, Franco-Prussian war. And so they decide to leave, you know, for their safety. So yeah, she's, you know, there's all these different parts of her identity that come into the fore and shape who she was, you know, and make her a really, really fascinating um, person to understand issues of gender equity. And so with that, I want to thank you all so much for this great conversation. I really appreciate your input. It's been a real pleasure to be part of this conversation and to be part of the 2021 Youth Summit. So take care, everyone. Have a good evening. And thanks again. Bye. Thank you so much, Janet and students, for joining us for this most elucidating conversation. And thank you, the viewer, for watching. We hope you learned more about Elizabeth May and perhaps yourself in the process. Elizabeth May's admonition to everyone whom she encountered was sursum, which is Latin for arise. I do hope you're inspired and ready to challenge your horizons as well. If you'd like to know more about Elizabeth May and our museum, please visit our website at www.elizabethmaymuseum.org or at our friends group's website at www themay.org. Feel free to reach out to me personally if you have questions. I can be reached at may at austintexas.gov. That's may at austintexas.gov, all spelled out. This presentation was funded in part by a grant from the Smithsonian Affiliates Program, whose National Youth Summit is made possible in turn by the A. James and Alice B. Clark Foundation and the Patrick F. Taylor Foundation, K through 12 Learning Endowment. It is part of a, la a larger Smithsonian initiative focused on civic engagement intended to help Americans understand the past in order to make sense of the present and to shape a more informed future. Thank you very much for joining us and have a great day.